My guest tonight is riding the crest of a gigantic wave of success. With his first English film, he joined the ranks of the great directors of the world. The unveiling of this great talent came through two women, two queens. In 1995, the bandit queen. And then, the other queen. I crown thee, Elizabeth, Queen of England, Ireland, and France. Box office smash it, Golden Globe Awards, Critics Awards, Oscar nominations. It's the kind of success dreams are made of. I am proud to have as my guest the incredibly talented Shekhar Kapoor. Hi, Shekhar. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. We've waited a long time. <laughs> well, I hope it's worth it. It's worth it just to meet you again after so many years. If somebody had told you 10 years ago, Shekhar Kapoor, your film is going to be up there with the Golden Globe Awards and the Oscars, how would you have reacted? I would probably have said, Aapke mumme ghi shakkar. I don't disbelieve any dream, any fantasy that I've ever had. Because um, if I disbelieved it, it would never happen. Mm. And ultimately, it's your dreams and fantasies that come true. So. so today, in its reality, how do you react to it? Um, it's interesting and it's exciting. Each thing that happens is one step forward and you say, you know, it's like climbing a mountain and then you've climbed a bit more and say, okay, I've got there, now I can't rest too much, and now I've got to start all over again. Things are happening so fast. And then the next peak comes so fast for you. It hasn't come that fast. I've been in this business a long time. Uh, it might have just got coalesced into, into one thing, but the learning process has been going on. I mean, I mm -hmm. made my first film um, in 1983, so it's been a long time. You have arrived where no Indian has gone before. It's the ultimate dream of every filmmaker. Why aren't you euphoric? Why aren't you crowing? I'll draw another analogy from mountaineering because that's something I used to love doing. The higher you go, the more rarefied the atmosphere is and you can't really breathe too much. And you have to understand that you can't stay in one place very long. So the euphoria is, is strange. You don't have the time to be euphoric. Uh, you, can't, um, you don't have the oxygen to be euphoric. You know that you have to either move on or come down and start all over again. Yeah. So the euphoria very fast gets taken over by what you have to do next. Um, yeah, you're satisfied slightly for a while. That's what happens. But how has this success changed your life? Basically, what changes in success is the way other people perceive you. True. I failed so often in my life and succeeded so often in my life that you learn very fast that you cannot allow yourself to be dominated by other people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. If you embrace the way other people perceive you, then you must equally embrace the way they perceive you when you're a failure. Mm -hmm. and it's all a cycle. I want to get, try and understand what you feel. Is it overwhelming? Um, it's stress. It's stress? Yeah. Because suddenly you have many more options. And options are always stressful. If you don't have an option, then you know what it's you have simple. to do. Life is simple. Yeah, life is simple. And now suddenly you've got like yeah. options as wide as this world.
if I choose to make a film now, I have a choice between 200 films all over the world that I'm being offered. I can no longer say, well, I had no choice. I had to make that film. It was the only film I had. Uh, yeah, now I'm responsible 100% for my next option that I take. When you finished Elizabeth, were you happy with the film? Were you sure you'd got it right? I'm still not sure I've got it right. Uh, I find it difficult to see it. I find it's taken me three years to accept Bandit Queen because every time I saw Bandit Queen, I saw what I should have done. Yeah, now, uh, when I um, sit and watch Elizabeth, I haven't gotten over what I haven't done yet. I still cringe. I still see a shot and I still cringe. I just, I just, I want to walk out of the theater because of all the mistakes that I made. And, and then what do you make of all the, the wonderful reviews and the box office? Um, I'm lucky. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it because when I'm making it, I'm, I'm groping. Every time I make a film hmm. and people like it, it surprises me. When you, uh, when you started working on Elizabeth, you were fairly unknown in the international scene apart from Bandit Queen. Tell me, were there any skeptics or any doubters? Yeah. There were? Of course. There are doubters in every, um, every, every time you make a film, there are doubters. Mm. The very people that asked you to make the film, having made a very brave decision, then are afraid of the decision they just made. Mm. All of us, you know, mm. when you, you fall in love with somebody, you ask them to marry you. On the night of the marriage. You wonder. Yeah, you are afraid. So, of course. Uh, I, even the people that asked me to make the film, when I started uh, uh, getting into the film, they were afraid. Right it was now. a different culture, a different era, and an Indian coming here and doing something on this culture, how's it going to work? They must have had their fears and their qualms. And you sense their fear, yeah. because suddenly they're putting $25 million on, on, on a man that's never made a film in English. Exactly. Uh, on a man that's never made a film outside India. On a man that's never made a film over $1 million. Mm. It's a scary business because it's like somebody else driving your car all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and people have put all this money in and you're in charge. Mm. And that's why as a director you have to become like a czar. How do you do that? No, you haven't seen me on the set. I'm, I'm not approachable to any questions. I think I just have such a confident... Um, aggressive air about myself. You work with such a formidable, eclectic star cast. Was it easy getting them? No. no. They all said no. What are you saying? Yeah, initially everybody said no. What the film you see is not on paper. Hmm. And I knew that we had uh, a script that was not exciting. So Jeffrey Rush had said no. Uh, Kate Blanchett had said no. Joseph Fiennes had said no to the script. So when I came in and I started to talk to them, then I gave them no choice. Um, like how? Uh, I just said no, 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 you're wrong. You don't see the film that I see. So the film that you read on paper is not the film that I see, and if you, fortunately they've all seen Bandit Queen. Yes, that's, in, that's yeah, very important. Yeah, absolutely. What about uh, Lord Attenborough? How did you get him to go? Oh, he was the easiest. Um, when I wanted Lord Attenborough, they, uh, everybody said, no, 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 he'll never do it. It's too expensive. Everybody's afraid of approaching him. And I just wrote him a letter saying, you know, you read Gandhi in India, we pulled out the stops. Um, now. We, uh, I'm doing Elizabeth here, and I really appreciate it if you come and join me in this endeavor. And lo and behold, he phoned me and said, dear boy, of <laughs> course, darling, I will do it. And, and uh, it was, he was the easiest, actually. He's the oh, one who, who said no. That? And he, of course, goes around telling everybody that, watch out, Sheikh, he's very really dangerous. If you want to say no to him, don't talk to him, don't meet him, <laughs> because he'll charm you into doing anything. Um, what about Fanny? Fanny Adon said no. What did you say? I said, don't say no till you meet me. Because she had only two scenes, and she's a huge star in France. And there were only two scenes for her in the film. So I went to Paris. Mm. 
um, and I met her in a hotel. You know, they had seats in the, one of the corridors, like. Mm. And I said, okay, let me tell you about the scenes. And she said, okay, tell me. And I enacted with her that scene that she did with Jeffrey Rush, mm. just sitting there, <laughs> right there in the hotel bar. And I, it's a scene of great seduction. So I just did it with her right there. I just met her and I said, let's do the scene now. Let's do it. And then she did it one way and I said, now you see, there are 10 ways that the character can go 10 times deeper. So by the end of it, when I left, she says, you think I can do all these things? So it was not no yeah. and longer. I said, I have full confidence. I've seen your movies. I'm sure you can do all these things. But I heard you proposed to Fanny as well. Uh, I did. What happened? Tell Where me about it. Where did you hear it. that? Tell me about it. Well, no, in the, in the end, I, I just said, okay, you have uh, a choice. Mm. You can either do my film or you could marry me. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, well, I think I'll do your film. <laughs> You're not such an exciting man. And she came to the movie. It was great fun, though. <laughs> That's Who told you that? I do my research. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, and what about uh, Sir John Gielgud? I mean, he's the... He was all right. And he was very interested in doing it because, you know, he's 94 years old. I know. The only thing that the agent said that he only works between 11 and, and, and 1. So he can only be with you in two hours a day. Mm. And uh, watch out, he stares at the camera. Not and during a shot? During a shot. Why did he do that? I don't know. And I said, no, no, come on. It can't be. And I remember when I was shooting with him, um, my camera operator came to me and he said, Shekhar, this is really disconcerting. I said, why? He said, he's looking directly at me. <laughs> and I said, it's all right. So I put the camera where he would have to turn around and, and stare at it like that and uh -huh. not at the actor. I don't know. I think it's years of, of theater. Uh, because you relate directly to an audience. He's looking at the audience. He's looking at the audience. But you know, he just remembered all his lines like that. It really? was so strange. That's I mean, at 94, to give somebody two pages of, of dialogue and like, uh, and he's ready. That's training. Good old training. But today, Hollywood is on the line. Who are the ones that you've enjoyed meeting? Who you vibed with? Uh, Antonio, of course. He's yes. a very dear friend. Uh, Brad. Richard Gere, I've mm. known for a long time. Um, Nicholas Cage. You're playing it very safe. You're telling me all about the guys, <laughs> not about the girls. Um, I don't know the girls that well. Um, I know, I mean, I know Venona Ryder and Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, no, I don't actually know the girls very well, I'm afraid. And perhaps I am playing it safe. I, I think you are. <laughs> you see, I have an agent in Hollywood who sees it as his, his eternal duty right now to ensure that my next film is not with a woman in the lead. I think Sir Chitra has paid him off. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> How different are these people, these Western stars, to their counterparts in India? Uh, as human beings, they're not, not that different. Professionally, they're different. Um, why are they different? I think because they see themselves as professionals. Let's take Elizabeth, for example. I started, I would start shooting at seven in the morning and all, everybody, all the stars are supposed to re report on the sets at seven. Do you know, it did not mean 30 seconds past seven. But this is it did not mean one minute past seven. It meant mm -hmm. on the dot at seven o'clock. Whether it's your scene or not, everybody for the day would report on the sets. If your makeup is half done, you come half done. If you've... And I've never, ever, in the whole shooting of Elizabeth, ever remember any of the stars coming late. Ever. Second, they don't come expecting to be directed. Mm. Um, it's a bonus if you direct them. Mm. They, the professionalism, they understand that the professionalism requires them to be able to deliver to the director on the first rehearsal something that is of quality and what has they have learned from earlier conversations with the director. Um, if an actor came up and said, okay, so what do I do now? They would never get a job. Really? Yeah, they would never Can't get a job. Believe this. So how has the Hindi film industry reacted to your success? Actually, 
I just uh, noticed in, in, in Stardust the other day that they do uh, this thing about the 50 most powerful people in, in, in the film business, and I, I was amused to see that I was number one. I was the of most course. powerful. Um, but I thought, well, you know, power is power if you use your power. If you're not going to make a film in India, then how can you be the most powerful person? You're not going to make a film in India? Um, not, not in the next... I think I'm going to do another two films outside, so that's another two years gone. Yeah. So I think um, after two years, I'll be back to number 50. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. What does your passport say? Does it say actor or director no, for it occupation? Says film director. It says film director. But for a long time, it said chartered accountant. So from chartered accountant in your passport, you jumped to film, film director. director. Never, yeah. never was an actor in between. I was a little embarrassed to put film actor. <laughs> Actor, I was in, but I, I, not because I, de I, I demean actors in any way, because I wasn't an actor. You know, I was just a guy who came in and said, "I'm going to act." I'm not an actor. Did you enjoy acting? Um, I was trying to run before I could walk. Mm -hmm. I thought I was another De Niro, <laughs> and I didn't know the very basics of acting. You know, a few people tell you you're good looking, so you want to be an actor. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's it. So Plus the genes. They always count the genes here a lot. Yeah. Rhythm to hoga na body mein. Dance to kar lega. I I did not realize the folly of it. I did the moment I worked in my first film with actors like Nasir and Shabana, I realized how silly I was because suddenly I started working with people that had all this experience and all this this immense talent and, and, yeah. and, and techniques and everything. And I, I realized I was not doing it well. And that kept nagging me. I did not have the facility. I mean, I admire people like Amitabh or Amir or Shah Rukh and all that. Their, their ability to do it, and carry it off. I still have it. And knowing all the problems I had as an actor then, I have great admiration for actors now. OK. Um, despite two huge commercial triumphs in the 80s, Masoom and Mr. India, you found it difficult to get the kind of work you wanted in India. You have said that it was your own unbridled creative ego that gave you all the problems. Can you tell me what you feel today? I think it is wrong to put your ambitions onto other people. Um, there is a certain plateau over which um, Hindi cinema rests. Mm. And there is no reason to want to make the greatest film in the world for, for, for Hindi cinema or ask your actors to give the greatest performance in the world um, or get the greatest lighting in the world. Um, that striving obviously made every film run into trouble. That was one thing. Um, my ambitions, I was hoping that everybody else had the same ambitions that I did. Uh, that was one. I believe that the director is the most important person on a set. I think uh, you, you need to give obeisance to that creative energy of the director. And I found that that wasn't the case constantly. And so my ego would just take over and destroy it. You know, I believe one thing, and the system here believes that everything revolves around the star. And uh, that always created a problem with me. Whenever I did films with stars, I ran into a problem. Mm. You know, you, we work in a business where talented people don't always get the success they deserve. This is not to underrate your skills. But do you feel that some of the breaks that you've got have come by chance? I think all the breaks you get are by chance. This is what I wanted to know. How much of it is just hard work and how much is it that, that little fleeting meeting, no. that chance? Look, we live in a country of a billion people. It is impossible that there are not at least half a million people that have the same talent as my I do as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Half of them must be better. Mm -hmm. There must be at least a thousand people sitting in Bombay that are extremely talented directors who want to be directors. They don't get the chance. They may never get the chance. Now, there are two reasons they may never get the chance. A, because they don't trust their own destiny. Mm -hmm. They're too afraid of the chaos. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to take that jump. They feel secure in 
an illusory world of make-believe world of habit and security, which is totally make-believe in any case, mm. or it's not their destiny, totally, absolutely not their destiny. So it's a pretty numbing mm. thought, it's a pretty humbling thought mm. to know and keeps you grounded. That's true. You know, there is such a thing as a writer's wife. She guards his privacy, she gives him the, the environment to work in, protects him in a way. What does a director need? I need my solitude. Mm. That makes me kind of standoffish sometimes. Mm. Uh, I need understanding. Mm. I need a great understanding from my partner of that need for solitude. You know, and so the partner has to come to terms with that. It's that, those are difficult moments. Those are difficult moments. What is it like for a woman to have a relationship with Sheikha Kapoor? I've always been accused of not giving. And I often wonder, because I'm a very emotional person, um, I always felt that I gave too easily, and people say you don't give, give very easily. Um, I think it's difficult, and the only relationship, certainly my marriage survives because my wife uh, constantly makes me feel at ease. She has a great ability to constantly be affectionate, mm -hmm. and I, I, then I flower in that affection. I, I personally find it difficult to, to give immediately uh, affection and, 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 and it's not that I don't feel affectionate inside, it's not that I don't care inside. I'm shy. I'm shy of expressing it. Mm -hmm. And when it gets expressed, then I flower in it. Mm -hmm. I'm learning from her. Do not be shy of affection. Mm. I'm trying to learn to give. But like a little child, I sit there still and wait for it to come. Yeah, you know, children do that. Yeah. You know, children do that. And somebody comes and does that and do you, and then children react. Mm. That comfort I'm discovering. I can understand. I'm looking forward to meeting Suchitra and talking to her about the difficult moments and the happy moments. Okay.